it's not really how much how much gold to silver you have or how, how much ammo you have or how much you're prepared for the next crash. It's how much your community is. And and if this election is going to be successful, then uh, bringing the American people back together will give it the best chance of surviving the endgame intact as a, as a political unit. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for November 18th through November 25th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one-ounce silver Austrian Philharmonics at just $3.09 over spot per ounce. We also feature the limited edition 2024 one-ounce gold UK Lion and Eagle coin at just $99 over spot per ounce. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Rafi Farber from The Endgame Investor. Rafi, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be back, Elijah. Well, it's great to have you. I did want to discuss the bond market. We can start with, you've mentioned how bond yields are rising, even though the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates. So we don't normally see this happen. Can you expand, expand kind of on the significance and what this means? Yeah. So this is a, a theory that I guess I just came up with. Um, I mean, it seems logical to me, but this is all, this is new territory for everyone because we've, uh, just entered a bond bear market for the first time since 1981. And, uh, so it's, it's new for all of us as, uh, as traders and unless you're, you know, seventies, eighties, uh, maybe late sixties. Uh, so what I found is that, uh, rising long-term bond yields, like 10, 20, 30 year treasuries, um, hasn't happened together with a rate cutting cycle since 1981. Uh, I looked in the, in the data, I, t I, t I could you get a Fred chart from the St. Louis Fed, uh, looking at the Fed funds rate, and every time it went down, every time the Fed started cutting, what happened to long-term rates? And uh, since 1981, they've always gone down. Um, there, was, there was one uh, little possible exception in 2008, um, but it wasn't really an exception because, uh, excuse me, hmm, there was a, a short period in 2008, from about March to June. Um, when the Fed wasn't cutting, and during that time, uh, the 10-year the yield went up. Uh, I also looked into why that was, and during that time, actually, most people are not aware of this because we, we equate um, 2008 with the start of QE and bond buying and money printing, but it wasn't exactly that way. Um, the, the Fed was expanding its balance sheet beginning in mid-2008, but uh, it did that simultaneously with uh, selling U.S. Treasuries because it was trying to balance things out. There was still some semblance of uh, let's not be too uh, dovish or liberal with money printing here. So they were selling Treasuries during that time. So there, there was a, that's a reason why bond yields were heading up while the Fed was holding rates steady. But if, if, we, uh, if we exclude that, it doesn't have to be excluded in my, in my opinion. It's, it follows the pattern. But the point I'm making is that we haven't had sustained rise in long-term treasuries with a Fed rate cut since 1981. And before that, there was one time in 1974, it was like three or four months in 1974. Before that, 1969, 1970, and that's as far as the Fred data goes. I'm sure um, if we have some wonky people watching this, they can go research uh, uh, rates. Uh, when was the time before 1969 at the Fed cut rates and long-term bond yields were up? I'm sure it happened maybe around World War II or something. Maybe once in the 50s, once in the 60s, but ch check it out. Uh, comment it below if you find any more evidence. But um, I think I have enough evidence to say that if the Fed is cutting and long term bond yields are rising anyway, then we're in a, a bond bear market. Because if you took those three data points 1969, 1974, 1981, those were all bond bear market. 1981 was the tail end of the blow off bottom or top of the, the bond bear market, depending if you want to look at bond yields or bond prices. Uh, and then since then, it hasn't happened. So uh, this is another confirmation that we're in a bond bear market, which means interest rates are going to go higher and higher and higher. And the only way the Fed can stop it is basically by bonding the entire bond market, which is basically what the Bank of Japan has done. Uh, but the Fed can't do that because that would destroy the dollar because uh, 
the the Bank of Japan is not in charge of the world's reserve currency, whereas the Federal Reserve is. So they can't really buy the entire bond market. They would make the dollar worthless. And by extension, every other fiat currency. So uh, that's that's basically where we're headed. There's no escaping from it. Um, so uh, can uh, uh, the other thing that I noted is that the, the left wing media is already picking up on this. They're picking up on the fact that they have no power. That nobody pays attention to them. Thank God for good reason. Nobody should. Um, so they're saying, well, well, what can stop Trump and his fascist agenda or whatever you want to call it? Uh, well, they say it's going to be bond yields. And in a way, they're right. I mean, it, he can't really control bond yields and it's going to end uh, the monetary system and Trump is going to be blamed for it. I mean, I think we all knew that's coming. Um, it's not like they're going to turn around and, you know, have their find God moment or anything like that. They're going to stay who they are and they're going to become less relevant, but they're going to be right about that. He's not going to stop the crash of the dollar. Just they're right for the wrong reasons. I think a lot of people's hopes with Trump is that he would help the economy. And we saw that big boost from the, uh, you know, the big reaction after election day, the stock market rising, you know, the Dow rising almost 1500 points there. But to your point, you know, there's still very powerful people in government that can uh, change things and, and might be looking to, you know, uh, possibly blame an economic a crash on Trump. Your perspective on that, how will this crashing of the bond market and all of this impact the average person? What should people be looking out for? Um, people should be looking out for persistently rising bond yields, which are going to happen. I just don't know how fast it's going to happen. Um, you should not go into the Trump administration. And though I am personally very relieved that that he was elected, I did not vote for him. I didn't. I didn't vote at all. Um, I would have I would have voted for him had I been in the U.S., but um, I'm a f uh, I'm a registered voter in Florida, so it really wasn't uh, that important for me to do it. I think he won Florida by like 16 points or something. That's because of all the all the COVID refugees uh, fled to Florida because it was the only state that was open. So uh, that that turned the state red. Um, so uh, don't don't expect him to save the dollar or save the economy. There are some things that he can do that would help. Um, individual people or classes of people like the middle class, maybe for a few months or something, uh, tax cuts or whatever. And I'm all for that. That's fine. Um, but he's not going to be able to stop the spending. I mean, this Department of Government Efficiency, it's, it sounds really exciting. I'm not going to deny that it's, it sounds exciting. Um, but, but keep in mind that, that we're in a, sy a system where debt equals money, right? That's not just a saying. That's transitive property. Right? If if debt equals money, less debt means less money. Less money means uh, it means banking crisis, crash, stock market crash, whatever whatever a company is a financial crisis. We're all familiar with it. So if he stops this, if he stops the debt, he stops the money, and uh, and then you have a crash. So okay, if he if he cuts spending radically by two three trillion dollars, whatever you want to say, there's going to be a crash. He's he can't he can't change the laws of economics. He can't change the laws of the Austrian school business cycle, right? That, that's a, that's a law that was discovered by Mises, you know, uniting microeconomics with macroeconomics in the single system. It's like the grand unified theory of economics, you could call it. And he's not going to get around that. He's not going to break the law of gravity, right? So you, you have to continue to stack gold and silver if that's what you've been doing. Um, continue to do it responsibly. Uh, same, you know, a, a, a fixed amount every month is probably the best way to do it and not worry about prices. And um, what what I would say, though, is that that we had two choices coming into this election. We were going to either head into the end game dirty, or we were going to we were going to he uh, head into it in a more cathartic. Um, let's remember who we are as Americans, as the West, what made the country great, um, and come back to the the good that's left here before we have to deal with this stuff. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to head into the end game. We're going to head into a monetary crisis. Everything um, that we've been predicting is going to happen. It's just going to happen with um, a little bit more of a, a sane polity. Um, a group of, uh, you know, a, a country that has more of a uh, head on its shoulders and it recognizes, for example, basic biological fact um, and maybe uh, gets itself a little bit more healthy uh, and we are able to find out who's on the, uh, the Epstein Black Book or who killed Kennedy or whatever these, whatever these nagging questions are that have been haunting Americans for decades, maybe we have a chance of uncovering them now. And if nothing changes, then we'll know that voting is a sham completely. Because if, if ever there was going to be change, it's going to be now or never. Now, speaking of the change that we could see, obviously, uh, RFK 
being tapped for in a head of health and human services. Uh, your perspective on on the changes here, and can you expand on um, how much this actually matters? Because it seems like it it, it is important, I, I think, to have you know a patriotic public if we have a crash, so that people don't just you know look for the government to save them them uh, look to the government to save them, but instead really look towards um, you know each other to realize that you know, we are Americans, we can do this together. So your perspective on that, how, how important is that going into a crash that now Trump is the, is the man in charge and we have this patriotic public? I would, I would hope that I don't think it's going to happen because uh, Trump has a big ego, but I would hope that, um, with the life experience he has, he has garnered in this campaign, specifically coming near death and, uh, maybe becoming more of a religious person. Um, he would come into this with more humility saying, look, I can't stop all the debt that's been accumulated for decades before me. So, uh, uh, you know, be prepared, uh, be wise, and, um, and we'll try to get through this together and not make any crazy promises like he did last term. Um, <clears throat> but I think the, the importance of people like RFK in charge of health and human services, also Tulsi Gabbard, who has been attacked by the intelligence agencies. Now she's in charge of the intelligence agencies, or she will be. Um, let's just, let's just assume they all get confirmed somehow, either through recent appointments or whatever. Um, I think that besides any specific issue that these, uh, these cabinet ministers might, uh, be able to bring to, to the forefront, um, if there is a successful in even two or three major issues, then it will help, um, re help Americans regain the realization that they've got to they've got to be the watchdogs on their government. They can't trust whatever comes out of it. And if we're able to have any of these cathartic moments, where, for example, oh my God, they've been putting this crap in our food for so long, or these medical interventions have been untested and unsafe for this and this many years since this act or whatever, and I don't want to use any keywords. Um, but if if these things can come to light, um, Americans might be able to recapture the spirit of of the revolution where they stopped trusting the british government they stopped uh, seeing it as legitimate and uh really they they come back to themselves and say look we're in charge here we're the people and we're in charge of this government and we're not gonna let the deep state you know, uh walk all over us anymore if they can get back to that then you can get through any crisis you can help each other it's a, it's, a, it, it's not a threat that many people are going to become poor because while many people become poor it's going to balance out. Like people become rich when other people become poor. There's nothing that happens in a financial crisis where you have a loss of wealth. You just have a redistribution of it. So if you can have a country where the people that have the wealth, which are going to be the stackers, are going to be people with real assets, if if we're already coming back together and and realizing that we can help each other without government, that's what we're supposed to do. Then we can get through this. You can get through. It doesn't matter how bad it is. And that's what you really want. It's not. It's not really how much how much gold to silver you have or how, how much ammo you have or how much you're prepared for the next crash. It's how much your community is. And, and if this election is going to be successful, then uh, bringing the American people back together will give it the best chance of surviving the end game intact as a, as a political unit. I would like to discuss maybe a few more aspects of what we see happening in the financial system. Uh, you're going to be writing soon about the basis trade and how um, short positions are at record highs for certain uh, bond yields. Your perspective on that, and can you expand a bit more on how that is going to be impacting the bond market? So I think this is going to be the the proximate trigger of of the next financial crisis. I could be wrong, um, but the direction that I see it going in, it's it's just it's heading in, in a single direction very very quickly. Um, what I'm seeing is, for example, if you take a look at the the open short positions on the five-year and the two-year treasury notes, they keep getting more and more extreme week by week by week if you look at the COT reports, the commitment of traders reports. Um, and to open short positions, you need dollars, right? And for dollars, uh, in order to make any money on these trades, you need to multiply them over and over and over again. So you need to borrow a lot of money, a lot of leverage. That's how leverage works, right? So the, the firms that, that do these trades get leverage through the, the repo market and the repo market is running out of dollars. And when it does, you have all these all these firms, um, hedge funds, whatever they are, that are opening these trades every day and, and recycling them with with borrowed money. They they're also stuck in them. They can't get out, 
right? They see they see a winning trade, they keep multiplying it, and then it's like it's like when you start a Ponzi scheme, and then the first people need to redeem, you need to go more into uh, getting more clients in order to pay them back, and then you make more money eventually. But you need to you need you need to keep growing it. Same Ponzi principle. Uh, so that's that's what's happening with these basis trades. Like people on the other side want to close, and they have to open more. Uh, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger until you're out. Instead of new clients here, you're talking about new dollars, and the new dollars are running out. When they run out, um, all the trades are going to have to close at the same time, um, and until and unless the Fed uh, says, "Oh, here's more dollars." <laughs> um, how are they going to do that? They're going to buy uh, bonds like they always do. Uh, so this time, since since the the short positions are so massive. Um, the the amount of dollar printing is going to have to be a lot more extreme than it was even in 2020 and it's gonna have to be a lot quicker um and i think that that it might even happen before trump gets into office um we're at about a 74 percent ratio of total bank reserves of repos to total bank reserves like uh how many uh, how much of this money is being used for repos it's about 74 percent so last time we had an, uh, a repocalypse, as it was called in 2019, the ratio was about 83, 85%. So we're almost there. We might not get there by January. We might get there by January, but, it, it, but it's going in one direction. You know, it zigzags up and down. Eventually, it's going to reach it. When it does, the Fed's going to have to print. And when it does, the dollar's going to fall. You mentioned how um, the stacking is still a very good option right now, and maybe on a monthly basis to dollar cost average. I did want to ask you about the price action we've seen recently because you know we saw a historic run up to all-time highs after all-time all-time high after all-time high for gold uh but we saw a sharp pullback recently uh to below 2600 um and you know some people are saying that that's probably uh the end of it we're you know off to the races from here your perspective on where we are is this a good buying opportunity in your view um, I think it's a pretty good buying opportunity. I looked at the I looked at the the low versus the high. I think it came out nine point three percent. Nine point three percent is a perfectly normal correction. You don't even have to sweat about it. I mean, these things happen during the two thousand nine to two thousand eleven major bull run at the end of the gold bull market in those two years. And uh, you know, it, now it, it, we barely see those on a map anymore. Um, so what are we sweating about a 9.3% correction? It's a little bit more frustrating when, when, uh, you know, Bitcoin reaches like 95,000 or whatever it's at. And, uh, that's, that's great. I, I, I mean, I hope Bitcoin is money. I don't think it is. And, uh, I'm, I'm happy if you're uh, a liberty minded person who has a lot of money now, that's great. Um, just be careful with it and, and lock some of it away into an asset that has, you know, 5,000 years of history instead of just like 15. Um, it's just, uh, it's what I, what I would do. Um, so is this, is this the bottom? We don't know. I don't think gold's going to go off to the races until the next printing round starts. It could stop. We could stop the decline here and we could head up steadily higher on a stair step way. Like we did in, uh, the end of the last bull market. I think that's, what's going to happen. Um, but again, like if you've been buying every month and you've been buying, you know, a, a certain dollar amount every month for the past, you know, year, does it really make a difference if you got in at 2800 and then you buy another tranche at 2550 and then next month it's 2700? Like, who cares? Um, we've got to stop looking at the dollar price. Um, the dollar price doesn't really matter with gold. It matters with Bitcoin. If Bitcoin doesn't keep going higher, I think people lose interest, but nobody's ever going to lose interest in gold. It doesn't make any sense. No, I think that's very key. And it, as you mentioned, between gold and Bitcoin, a lot of Bitcoin has been getting the headlines recently as it's racing towards 100,000, uh, you know, hitting all time high, highs over 90,000 right now. Um, but as you mentioned, it doesn't really have the history. Um, so you did just recently do a video about how this is when I'll admit I'm wrong about Bitcoin. Your, if you could expand on your take on, on Bitcoin and, and why you're not convinced by it yet. Uh, well, look, um, basically there were two things. Um, the head of Cantor Fitzgerald, I don't, I don't even know when this conference took place. It was in 2024. I think it was in, in the middle of the year, maybe a few months ago. Could even be more recent. He said that, uh, that, that first of all, the, the biggest crypto trading pair 
is uh, tether, uh, tether to Bitcoin. Because when you're trading Bitcoin in and out of it, which most people do, um, they, they, use, uh, they use tether to get in and out. Right? So uh, he was saying that tether is very important because every time somebody buys tether, uh, which is basically when anybody sells Bitcoin for tether, um, then they have to buy treasuries in order to cover that because they're supposed to be back and they're supposed to maintain a peg. So uh, the t tether is basically financing the U.S. government to a certain degree. And he's right. Um, he seems very excited about that. He's a big bankster, Howard Lutnick, and I think he's being considered for the U.S. Treasury Secretary, which I'm not so happy about. But, uh, you know, it's hit or miss with Trump. And a lot of his nominees are good and a lot of them aren't. So uh, this is one that wouldn't be. Um, and it's not to take anything away from RFK and, uh, and Tulsi Gabbard and Matt Gates, who are, you know, seem awesome. Um, the other thing uh, that besides uh, Bitcoin financing the U.S. Treasury and it attracting a lot of bankster attention of people that we wouldn't normally want associated with us uh, is I said, when am I going to be wrong about Bitcoin? When we see the next financial crisis, the next monetary crunch and the bond market collapsing and what I said about the repos and running out of dollars and, and uh, the money markets freezing up just like it did in 2020 and 2008, if that happens again, it's going to happen again. When that happens again, if Bitcoin can maintain its price in gold terms, um, not in dollar terms, I don't care about the dollar terms, but if the Bitcoin to gold ratio can stay stable during that sort of crisis, then I'd say, okay, fine. Bitcoin is Bitcoin. I wouldn't say it's money, but I'd say it's a it's a it's a viable money derivative. Okay, because when when those things happen, when you have a monetary crisis, it looks like gold's going down, but it's not. Gold always goes up during those crises in terms of other commodities, in terms of stocks, in terms of everything else except for dollars, because dollars is the chief gold derivative, right? But in, in a financial crisis, if you're real money, you're going to go up, not down. So if I'm not even saying that Bitcoin has to go up in gold terms. I'm saying it just let's stay relatively stable. It did not in 2022, not even close. It went from 37 and a half ounces to 10. This time, I think it's going to be even worse. But if it's not, then, you know, at, at the end of the crisis, maybe I'll buy some Bitcoin. Um, uh, you know, uh, cause if it's, if it's a viable gold derivative, I'm not going to get rid of my gold. I'm not going to sell it, but yeah, I mean, I'll have some blockchain gold stuff. I don't see uh, things. I don't see that happening because if you want blockchain gold, there is blockchain gold. Just buy that. W why, why Bitcoin? I don't, I don't get, yeah, I could be wrong, but I can't see how it's a viable gold derivative. It might be, and they would have to prove it empirically, even though I can't figure out logically how it would work. Definitely. It's a different animal from gold and it hasn't proven itself as you, as you mentioned um, yet. And I guess we'll have to wait and see on that. But something that has proven itself for 6,000 years is gold and it's always had value in times of crisis as well. So um, before we let you go, if our viewers are interested in learning more, kind of tracking the end game with you, uh, where can they go? Uh, first place you want to go is uh, end game investor at Substack. There's a lot of free articles there on monetary philosophy that you'll enjoy, and it'll give you a good picture on how I think of thi and how I think of the monetary universe. Um, and the other place you want to go is uh, my YouTube channel, Rafi Farber. Um, the uh, the Silver Report that used to be uh, on Arcadia Economics is now there. Uh, on Friday mornings, I publish it. If you're a fan of that, that's on my channel, Rafi Farber, and uh, you can also check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash endgame investor for a more religious angle on these topics and yes they've been they've as you've been saying gold has been around for five to six thousand years monetary topics and economics have been discussed for five six thousand years in the bible and uh, um i i open up those uh those instances and those discussions uh to uh to people who might not have seen them before fantastic rafi once again thank you so much for your time today and god bless you too this is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for November 18th through November 25th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce silver Austrian Philharmonics at just $3.09 .09 over spot per ounce. We also feature the limited edition 2024 one ounce gold UK Lion and Eagle coin at just $99 over spot per ounce. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.